Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna take a look at stress. And specifically, we're gonna focus on something called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and more specifically focus on an important hormone called cortisol, often referred to as our stress hormone. So the first place we need to start is to define what stress actually is. So stress is any potential or actual threat to homeostasis. And remember what homeostasis is. Homeostasis is all the functions of our body, whether it's blood pressure, respiratory rate, blood glucose, they all have this happy, healthy range that they want to sit within. Now, the body always tries to maintain this happy, healthy range, and that's called homeostasis. Sometimes there are external or internal triggers that try to push us out of homeostasis, tries to push it too high or too low, but luckily the body can respond to maintain homeostasis. If it goes too high, we bring it back down. If it goes too low, we bring it back up. So anything that tries to kick us out of homeostasis, we could term as a stressor. Right? So that means anything external or internal. So anything that may try to kick our blood pressure out of whack or our blood glucose out of whack, for example, it could be determined or called a stressor. Now you're probably thinking, well, when I think stress, I think emotional stress. I think the stress of needing to finish an assignment or hand a work project in on time or just the general stresses of life. And they are stressors and they are important because psychological stresses and these physiological stresses, they all culminate on this important hormone called cortisol. And cortisol is released to try and put us in the best situation possible to deal with these stresses and maintain homeostasis. All right, when we talk about cortisol, cortisol can have really important effects on the body and you can broadly base it on the systems. So cortisol has effects on the nervous system, on the immune system, on the cardiovascular system, uh, on the endocrine system. So broad effects, but you could probably break cortisol's effects down into behavioral and physiological. So let's look at that. So firstly, what are the behavioral effects of cortisol? So the behavioral effects of cortisol is that when cortisol is released, it can help increase awareness and arousal. It can increase cognition. It can increase analgesia if it needs to. So what is all this referring to? So think about it. You're in some sort of stressful situation and it could be something internally is kicking the body out of homeostasis or trying to or something externally. It could be emotional trying to kick the body out of homeostasis. Cortisol release can help make us more aware or aroused of that situation. If we're more aware, then we have a better understanding of that stress and we can deal with it most appropriately. Increased cognition, again, an understanding of what's happening in that scenario. Sometimes the stressful environment will stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, and sometimes we're in a fight or flight response where we may have to actually engage physically with something, or the stressor is some sort of trauma, for example, and it might result in pain. And so cortisol can help with the analgesic response. So this is to mitigate pain, very important. So the C, these are some behavioral responses when it comes to cortisol. Let's look at the physiological responses. The physiological responses are broad. They're multi-organ system covering. And so what we're gonna find is cortisol will increase cardiovascular tone. It increases respiratory rate, so respo rate. It increases metabolic intermediates, but also decreases immune function. It decreases digestion. It decreases growth signals. And it decreases reproduction, or at least the need slash desire for reproduction. Now, let's think about that stress. The way I think about it is like this. When you're stressed, people think of the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response. That is part of stress. Cortisol is entwined in the sympathetic nervous system, but it's also separate to it. And this is how you should think about it. The sympathetic nervous system will be activated to deal with that, that stress immediately. 
You'll either fight to get rid of the stress or run away to get rid of that stress. And everything the sympathetic nervous system does is to deal with that in that moment. Now, while cortisol is released in times of stress, its effects are a little bit longer lasting. They don't peak until around about 20 minutes after, which may be a little bit too late to deal with the immediate stress. But the way you should think about cortisol is it helps deal with the stress in the moment and it helps deal with the stress immediately after and a little bit longer term after that. Now, it'll make sense as we move through what I'm referring to. So think about this. If we increase cardiovascular tone, we're increasing blood pressure, blood being pushed around the body, we're increasing respiratory rate as well. These two things working together help to increase the amount of oxygen and nutrients being delivered to important tissues of the body. Tick stress response, increasing in metabolic intermediates. So these metabolic intermediates can include things like glucose, most predominantly glucose, which is gonna be mobilized from the liver predominantly into the bloodstream. And now I've got this available energy source floating through the bloodstream. Perfect. Decreases immune function. This costs a lot of energy, the immune system. And in a time of stress, we wanna redirect our resources to other parts of the body that may need it. Maybe muscles, for example, maybe other systems. So we decrease immune function in that moment. We decrease digestion. This is parasympathetic. This is resting. This is the opposite to times of stress. Growth is anabolic. It's building. And in this time, we're in more of a catabolic state. And reproduction is also that as well. It is a parasympathetic response. And it is that obvious desire to pass on to the next generation. This is something that is a more longer term important goal. But in the immediate, we just want immediate survival. So this is repressed as well. So these are some of the effects that cortisol has. What we need to talk about is cortisol, where it's released, what it does specifically. They're very broad. But we can talk more specifically about what cortisol does. So where we need to start is going to be at the brain. So we've got the cerebrum. Here's one cerebral hemisphere. We've got a mid-sagittal section looking at it laterally from the side. Cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem, midbrain, pons, medulla, and most importantly, sitting at the base of the brain, we have the hypothalamus and its projection, the pituitary gland. This is where we're focusing on now. So let's draw up the hypothalamus with the pituitary gland. Great, let's label it hypothalamus. And remember that the hypothalamus is the master regulator of both the nervous system and the endocrine system. It's the master regulator of the autonomic nervous system. So that's the sympathetic fight or flight, parasympathetic rest and digest. But it's also the master regulator of the endocrine system. And this is where we're starting to focus our attention. Now, the hypothalamus has many varying nuclei. So these are groups of cells that are really important. The group of cells that we need to talk about are called the PVN, the paraventricular nuclei, next to the third ventricles, right? Nuclei, groups of bodies in the central nervous system, cell bodies. So the paraventricular nuclei is super important. It's also the nexus of stress. Anytime you have some sort of stressful stimuli, and I'm just gonna say stress as an overarching umbrella term here, I'll go into the specific shortly, but any sort of stressful stimuli that's coming in will go to the paraventricular nuclei. And importantly, the way the paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus responds is it produces a 31 amino acid long peptide called corticotropin releasing hormone, also known as corticotropin releasing factor. Let's write it up. Corticotropin releasing hormone. Like I said, sometimes termed corticotropin releasing factor. This is produced at the hypothalamus, travels down this bloodstream, this little portal system here that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Specifically, you have an anterior lobe or anterior aspect of the lobe and posterior aspect of the lobe. CRH will jump in, travel down, and get released at the anterior aspect of the pituitary gland. And here it stimulates the release of another hormone, which we call adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH. Let's write it down. Adrenocorticotropic 
hormone. Now, beautifully, it's all in the name. Where does it go? What does it do? Adreno goes to the adrenal gland. Cortico goes to the cortex of the adrenal gland. Tropic tells you that it's gonna stimulate the adrenal gland to release another hormone. That other hormone is cortisol. So ACTH is now in the systemic circulation. The bloodstream, it's floating through. It's gonna find very specific receptors to ACTH. It's gonna travel until it gets to the kidneys and most specifically, till it gets to that little hat that sits on the kidneys called the adrenal gland. Now specifically, I told you ACTH is traveling to the adrenal gland, but it's traveling to the cortex of the adrenal gland. That's the outer layer of the adrenal gland. And specifically, it's traveling to a zone area of the cortex called the zona fasciculata. The zona fasciculata. Now the zona fasciculata is going to have receptors on it. And these receptors are MC2R receptors. Melanocortin type 2 receptors. And they specifically will bind to, or ACTH will bind to these receptors. Again, present at the zona fasciculata. And what they do is they now stimulate a process termed steroidogenesis. Steroidogenesis is the production of steroid hormones from cholesterol. And steroidal genesis will produce glucocorticoids. Glucocorticoids. Now there's also mineralocorticoids, but they're not the focus of stress response. Glucocorticoids are, and the main glucocorticoid you need to know is that of cortisol. So that means cortisol is gonna be released at the zona fasciculata. Now a couple of important points. First important point, Cortisol is released into the systemic circulation so it can float around the body. Second important point is that the cortisol that's released starts to diffuse or percolate its way down to deeper aspects of the adrenal gland, down into the medulla. Now, what do you know about the medulla of the adrenal gland? It is filled with sympathetic neurons. The sympathetic nervous system is a two neuron chain so this two neuron chain has one neuron going from the central nervous system out and then another neuron going to the target organ. The first neuron releases acetylcholine, second neuron releases adrenaline. The only time this is different is the adrenal gland where you've got the first neuron coming out and it synapses with the medulla of the adrenal gland because the neurons in the medulla act as postganglionic neurons and they release adrenaline. So now the cortisol that's diffused down stimulates the medulla and the medulla is going to release adrenaline. And this adrenaline is now also floating through the bloodstream. Cortisol, adrenaline floating through the systemic circulation and this is going to stimulate all these adrenergic or adrenaline based receptors and you get a sympathetic nervous system response. What type of response is that? It's going to be a response to help you deal with that stress immediately. So you get peripheral vasoconstriction, blood vessels in your skin constrict, shunting or pushing that blood to deeper aspects of the tissue like the muscle tissue so you can fight or run away. Your respiratory rate increases, more oxygen into the blood to be delivered to the tissues. Heart rate increases, blood pressure increases again delivering oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. Pupils dilate so you can see more around you. These are the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. They're immediate, they happen quickly so you can deal with the stress right then and there. But like I said to you, that's cortisol's job in the immediate to stimulate this. But cortisol, cortisol is investing in the future. Cortisol, all its effects I'm gonna talk about now are to help you when this is finished, when this is dealt with that immediate stress and you're about to look at what's happening immediately after, you're dealing with the aftermath of the stress response and even preparing for the next stress response. So therefore, what does cortisol do? Cortisol will travel through the bloodstream and because it's a steroid-based hormone based on cholesterol, so it's lipid-like, right, fat-like, it's going to travel to cells of the body. Now we know that cells have a nucleus and in that nucleus you've got DNA that need to be transcribed into genes and genes turn into proteins and proteins, well, genes translate into proteins, proteins do all the work in the body. So 
we get this cortisol coming in. Now let's just say the, this is cortisol. Cortisol, because it's lipid-based and cell membranes are lipid-based, they move straight in. Now there's gonna be other hormones like amino acid-based hormones. They can't move straight through. They need receptors on the surface, but not cortisol. Cortisol moves straight in. All the glucocorticoids move straight in. And what they do is they now need to bind to a receptor in the cytoplasm. And the receptor is a glucocorticoid receptor. Now the glucocorticoid receptor has a binding pocket, but it also is part of a complex with other proteins. One of the most important ones is one of the heat shock proteins. Once the glucocorticoid or cortisol binds, HSP, heat shock protein, disassociate and buggers off, goes somewhere else. And now the glucocorticoid receptor is free to jump into the nucleus and it will bind to very specific promoter or what we call glucocorticoid response elements. They're just promoters that help promote transcription of DNA. Now, it can sometimes repress it as well, but let's talk about what this glucocorticoid receptor can transcribe. So it's gonna transcribe genes. What type of genes? What are these genes important for? So there's a couple. So one of the genes that it transcribes is important for, or at least a couple of them are important for gluco, neo, Genesis. And this is phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxy kinase. PEP CK. Phosphoenyl pyruvate carboxy kinase. It's super important because it basically turns oxaloacetate, which is a uh, product of the Krebs cycle, and ultimately turns it into pyruvate, which we know is important for energy. But it's also stimulated for gluconeogenesis. So what's gluconeogenesis? Gluco is glucose, neo is new, genesis is the beginning of, read it backwards, the beginning of new glucose. This is the production of glucose from non-carbohydrate-based sources. What's a non-carbohydrate-based source? Fatty acids. So fatty acids, glycerol, and amino acids. So gluconeogenesis happening in the liver stimulates fatty acids, glycerol, and amino acids to jump into various aspects of metabolism to try and produce glucose. Now, glucose is increasing in the bloodstream. So this whole process leads to increased blood glucose levels. Increase blood glucose. That's one of the outcomes of cortisol, increased blood glucose. Now here's the thing, it makes sense because you go, well, a stressful situation we need energy in the bloodstream to be able to utilize to be utilized by tissues of the body to fight and run away and so forth but here's the thing that's not really why it's there the increased blood glucose is there for the aftermath why because cortisol remember once the glucose is in the bloodstream in order for muscles and fat tissue to be able to utilize it we need insulin cortisol blunts the effects of insulin stops it from working now what else increases blood glucose levels and stops insulin from working? Diabetes. And therefore, if cortisol is released too long over time, I'm now talking chronic stress. If you have chronic cortisol release, chronic stress activation, it leads to increased blood glucose levels without many tissues of the body being able to access it. And this chronic increased blood glucose levels can damage blood vessels, more specifically smaller blood vessels. And this is not good. This is very damaging and results in a diabetes-like disease state or diabetes. So not good. But why, you're probably thinking, then why do we do it? It's so that once the stress response is finished and cortisol has been dropped off, because cortisol gets released and then inhibited, released, inhibited. So in the inhibition times, insulin will work and the tissue can take it. So once the stress response is finished, We've got these wonderful building blocks, these energy substrates available for the tissues to be able to go, I'm gonna regenerate now. I'm gonna repair, I'm gonna prepare myself for the next stressful situation. So that's just one aspect of transcription that occurs. Another aspect of transcription is that of the immune system. So in actual fact, a glucocorticoid receptor can decrease the gene expression of certain immune products. So decrease, inflammation. Most specifically, it's referring to aspects of acute inflammation, short-term inflammation. And it can decrease certain types of uh, interferons and interleukins and tumor necrosis factors, which we all know are important for the immune system. So it can depress that. It can also depress 
the T cells as well, which we know is important for cell mediated immunity. Now, why is it doing this? Why would we want cortisol to suppress the immune system? Because it's energy hungry. A lot of energy goes towards the immune system. So we need to divert that energy for the time being. Importantly, it can promote wound healing. So while it may suppress the immune system, it can promote wound healing, at least in the acute aspects of cortisol release. But if cortisol is released for too long over time, chronic stress, you have chronic suppression of the immune system, makes your body susceptible to infection, that's the first thing, and then it actually inhibits wound healing. So it takes longer to repair. And this is important because this is why we've sort of hijacked cortisol with very synthetic types of cortisol. So dexamethasone, prednisone, both of those are synthetic cortisols, dexamethasone, prednisone. And dexamethasone, for example, is like 30 times stronger effect-wise than that of cortisol. And it's utilized in COVID, for example, because of the systemic inflammation that occurs to suppress it, all right? All right, so that's what we've got there. Other types of things that can occur, other types of transcription, include that of decreasing osteoblasts and increasing osteoclasts. So, Osteo means bone. Blast is referring to building, building bone. Osteoclasts, crushing bone. Bone is always constantly being remodeled. Building, breaking down, building, breaking down. Now, what will happen here with the transcription is that cortisol can actually decrease osteoblast differentiation and increase osteoblast apoptosis, so that's cell death. So osteoblasts go down. Osteoclasts, those that crush bone, break it apart, they get activated, they increase. So the overall effect of cortisol is to break the bone down and release the inorganics within that bone, the inorganic minerals like calcium and phosphate. Why? Because they're important building blocks just like the glucose that we've now released into the bloodstream that can be utilized. Remember, calcium is super important for neurons firing, for muscles to contract, and also they're very important for vesicles to release products through exocytosis, including neurotransmitters. So now they're available in that pool, in that blood system that we can utilize after this stress response. And if they're not utilized, after that cortisol drops back down, it's thrown back into the bone. Brilliant. But again, times of stress, if you're stressed chronically, you're breaking the bone down significantly over time and it can result in osteoporosis. So we've highlighted some of the important effects of cortisol, but what I wanna talk about now is what triggers this? All I've said is stress. So what types of stress can trigger this whole process from occurring? So let's now take a look up here. We've got the hypothalamus and the paraventricular nuclei. What's gonna trigger it? First thing, the types of stresses I said can be anything pushing homeostasis out of whack. So let's first talk about the organs or viscera of the body. We're gonna have, we've got the brain stem here, midbrain pons medulla. There's an aspect of the medulla in the dorsomedial aspect of the medulla, so back here, and that's called the nucleus of the solitary tract. And this is receiving afferents or input from the organs of the body. Now specifically, it's receiving inputs from three cranial nerves. These three cranial nerves are cranial nerve seven, cranial nerve nine, and cranial nerve 10. Now if you know your cranial nerves, you'll know that seven is facial, nine is glossopharyngeal, and 10 is vagus. And the way I like to think about these cranial nerves is they're gonna be receiving information from the organs of our body, from our mouth, throat, esophagus, stomach, heart, lungs, digestive system, whole bunch of organs. And if there's anything kicking them out of whack, these signals go up, 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 up to the nucleus of the solitary tract, and then that will project a signal to the paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is this area here called the lamina terminalis. Lamina terminalis. Now the lamina terminalis, you can see, sort of sits between the anterior commissure 
here and the optic chiasm here and it's a thin bit of tissue and it's really important because it picks up changes in osmo uh, osmotic pressure. So osmotic changes. Now osmosis is referring to concentration changes, right? So it picks up concentration changes of fluid floating around. If the concentration goes up, it's an indication that it's too concentrated and you may be dehydrated, right? So you've got a bucket of water with water and things dissolved in it. If you just take the water out, you're left with the dissolved substances and it's more concentrated. So this will pick up changes in osmosis. Now again, homeostasis. If it goes too high, it's kicking out of homeostasis, sends a signal to the paraventricular nuclei and specifically this is where it's a little bit different instead of triggering crh like the nucleus of the solitary tract did it actually triggers antidiuretic hormone to be released now antidiuretic hormone in the states is also known as vasopressin or arginine vasopressin and what it does antidiuretic hormone antidiuresis it opposes the output of urine or the output of fluid, fluid loss. So it maintains fluid reabsorption in the body, holds on to fluid because why are we doing this? Osmotic changes, we're thirsty, we're dehydrated, let's hold on to that fluid. So that travels to the kidneys, the tubules, the collecting ducts, puts holes in them, we pull water back into the body, we maintain hydration. Now here's the other thing, usually ADH is transported from the hypothalamus through neurons to the posterior pituitary where it's released. But in this scenario, yes, that also happens, but ADH can also jump into this portal system. And it travels down with CRH where it amplifies CRH's effect on stimulating ACTH release. So interestingly, ADH can stimulate ACTH release. Beautiful. Last thing I wanna talk about, well remember, sympathetic nervous system is being activated throughout this whole time. That feeds back as well, don't forget. But the last thing is the limbic system. So we're referring to areas of the prefrontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, and areas of the other areas of the limbic system, like the amygdala and the hippocampus. So they're not gonna be located in these areas that I'm writing because they're gonna overlap what I've got here. But let's just write the amygdala, and hippocampus. All right, so this is how you think about it. Prefrontal cortex, that's really important in understanding cognition awareness. Amygdala is important for your emotional connection with situations. Hippocampus is important for your memory of these situations. And so what can happen is that cortisol that's being released can influence these, and these can influence the release of cortisol. And it can be this circuitry and feedback system, which is very important. So first, the prefrontal cortex can inhibit aspects of cortisol release. The amygdala can activate. The hippocampus can inhibit, but they can also do varying activity here as well. So for example, let's just say cortisol is released in a time of stress. Cortisol can move back to the brain undergo various changes in transcription in the prefrontal cortex so that you change the way that you are aware or aroused by that stressful situation. So if it happens again, your response may be a little bit different. The amygdala, cortisol can change the way you have an emotional response, your emotional attachment. Maybe if you have that stressful situation arise again, you respond differently. Hippocampus, your memory, it results in these flash bulb like memories, like a flashback, where if the stressful situation happens again, you have this memory that occurs. And all of these can feed back to the paraventricular nucleus and stimulate the release of cortisol. And therefore, cortisol can go back and it can be this constant feedback loop if it isn't broken. Importantly, depressive states have been associated with varying levels of cortisol and these areas of the brain. For example, the hippocampus is important for depressive states and we've no, we know that smaller hippocampi have been associated with depressive states. And we think that's because, or at least in part, is that the hippocampus inhibits cortisol release. If it's smaller, it has less of an inhibitory effect and more cortisol can be released. But then cortisol can feed back 
and alter the way that you have memories of stressful situations. And it can lead to this nasty feedback loop and cycle, particularly when it comes to chronic stress situations. So that's just one way. We don't know a lot about it, but that's just a summary of how cortisol can affect the way you perceive situations and deal with them in the future, the way you have an emotional connection, and also the way that you remember that situation as well. So this is a quick run through of stress, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and importantly, cortisol.